So, uh, as I said at the beginning of this morning, there are rightly seasons of emphasis. So, in the early days of our movement, movements plural, we were contending for plural eldership rather than one pastor, we were contending for genuine spiritual authority, we were contending that that is instead of democracy, and hence a strong emphasis on eldership in a local church. Okay, now, <coughs> along with that, we felt in those days that eldership is male. <coughs> Why do I think that? Well, firstly, someone said to me, someone asked a question and wrote a question, am I just arguing for silence and there's no reference to female elders? I don't think I'm just arguing for silence, although it's true there aren't any references <laughs> to female elders. What I believe is that, um, firstly, the qualifications are husband, of one wife without, as there are for deacons, a reference to the women also. Okay. Um, I, so I don't think that could be wives, because if so, why not reference the wives of elders? Right. So, because uh, you would think that was almost as important as wives of deacons. So, no, no, so I think it is the women also who are deacons. Um, and Whereas that doesn't come in relation to eldership. Secondly, I would argue that the verse we read, the contentious verse we read about 1 Timothy chapter 2 about teaching and exercising authority must mean something. And I think it must mean something more than simply culture in Ephesus. Yeah. Okay? If it was just culture in Ephesus, you might say, okay. Uh, we don't have those sort of problems of a female goddess ruling over the city anymore, so it, it's only applying to that. I don't believe that. I believe that, as with the other scriptures, there is an underlying principle that is being worked out contextually. And the underlying principle, I believe, is those who both exercise authority and teach are... It's something that I do not permit a woman to do. Do you, do you see what I mean? That's what I think it means. I don't, I don't think it can mean, as I hope I've laboured enough this morning, they can't ever teach, because that would be inconsistent with elsewhere in Scripture. So that's, that's my argument, basically. So, um, and then third, my third argument for it would be that we still think in terms of position, institution, and so on, or even business. And if it's an institution or a business, I don't have any problem with women chief executives. Do you know what I mean? It's a business. But it's not. It's a family. And the whole emphasis in the New Testament and in Timothy, later in this epistle, treat older men as, speak, don't speak to an older man, um, but treat, uh, rebuke an older man harshly, but treat him as a father, older women as mothers, younger men as brothers, younger women as sisters, whilst keeping absolute purity. Okay. So it's clear he's talking, this, the church is a family, and consistently the New Testament uses family language to describe the church. Okay? And... Um, how apostolic ministry should function as well. And so, because we've lost that, both through the institutionalism of the church and the modern trend towards the commercialization of the church, we've lost the family atmosphere of the church, even though we would use the term family. Okay. But then loads of companies do, don't they? You go and buy something and they, oh, thank you for participating in the whatever company it is, family. No, I'm not. I'm buying something from you. Okay? <laughs> and so, uh, but the church is that. And it's always been that way. 
So when God promised to change the world through the seed of Abraham, he said, Abraham, through your family, every family on earth is going to be blessed. It's the whole ethos of New Testament life is the church as a family. So we have to think of it in family language. Therefore, fathers and mothers within the church are important, but they're not the same. Anymore as they're not the, they're equal, but they're not the same. Okay, and uh, therefore, elders should function like fathers in the church. As I said earlier, therefore, who want to release all of those within their care to serve. They're, they're there to provide the uh, tram lines, if you like, of doctrine, which must be strayed from, and they are there to bring security and safety to the church so that in the church all the gifts can function fully. I know one or two of the women that preach in our church have said to me, I like it when you're there because you look encouraging as what I'm doing and you, you know. And that's because that's, well, I'm an elder, not because I'm doing anything. Yeah. But I rarely do anything in our home church because it's my home church. I'm doing things when I travel around the world. Occasionally I preach couple of times a year, but generally speaking, I'm just there. Well, that's a bit of waste. No, no, it's not. Because I'm there yes. as a father yes. and it helps <laughs> those younger people, men and women who are teaching, that I'm there encouraging them. So I'm still acting as an elder. But that is not because I'm doing everything. It's because I'm enabling them to do so with security so this family argument I think I don't mean family argument that's not the wrong word for <laughs> the argument on the basis of the church and the family is important you may have a family argument as well that wasn't the point I was trying to make okay so so for those three reasons I believe that eldership is it's not just male, it's certain men who God has called to be fathers in the church. However, our emphasis on eldership in the early days of our restoration movement, because we wanted to restore that, rightly, it developed what I call an executive eldership where most things were initiated by the elders, most decisions were made by the elders, and there wasn't the same release of ministry, and we tended to forget that the purpose of leadership is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Um, and so, in looking at this issue of uh, women's ministry, it's caused us also to look at that. As I said, authority is to serve and release, and elders take servant leadership and accountable responsibility, and our fathers that enable the church to function with security. So what is, biblically, the responsibility and authority of elders? To guard the flock and protect the flock the church from false teachers. Okay. That is our responsibility. We're an elder. Doesn't mean we have to do all the teaching, but we are able to put things right if wrong stuff comes in. To teach and preach the word, yes, so I'd expect elders to preach from time to time. Not do all the preaching, but they are responsible to preach. To direct the affairs of the church. But I see that direction as an enabling direction, not a hands-on detailed direction. To exhort and admonish the saints in sound doctrine to, and to visit the sick and pray. Okay. Andrew Wilson concludes in one of his uh, writings on the subject, and Andrew and I have talked about this a lot, at root, the New Testament language about elders, shepherds, overseers, leaders and teachers is bound up 
with serving the church by protecting and guarding her from harm. Elders biblically are guardians. This role can be helpfully summarised in terms of three core priorities of eldership, providing direction, guarding doctrine, and ensuring discipline. Okay. So, however, that doesn't mean that they are the only people that do those things. They are responsible and accountable to God for it. But they're not the only ones. And the Bible has a wonderful balance on this. Even when it comes to discipline, which is sometimes, yeah, is eldership responsibility. But then it says, tell it to the church and let them listen to the church. Wow. We don't do that very often either, do we? That's what it says. Because there is a power um, and a... Remember, New Testament is just... The New Testament culture... I, that, sorry, that's not my opinion. The culture, in, the culture around in which the New Testament was written was a shame-based culture, not a guilt-based culture. Therefore, sh sh shame in a right sense was a powerful motivator. So all these people in the church are appealing me to give up my sin. That's, that's how it was. So tell it to the church. If they won't listen to the church, then. Okay. So elders are responsible for what's taught. They're not, they don't, doesn't mean nobody else. Because we're trying to equip teachers all the time. And we do that in lots of ways. We want to develop people. We want to develop a church for the future as well. During the, often during the summertime, so it's not too much of a pressure on them, we have lots of young teachers. People in their 20s. All that. And we say, come on, you. And they do brilliantly. Men and women. Yeah, I was astounded. You know, I just sat there like a father being proud of the young people doing it. Guess what you feel like as a father if your son or daughter do well, don't you? Yeah. Great. <clears throat> don't you? Yeah. So, because I wasn't travelling much during the summer, I was largely there. It was just great. <clears throat> to hear these young men and women teaching. Is that, well, shouldn't be the elders teaching us on the morning? No. I'm equipping, we're equipping the saints. Otherwise, you know, church will grow old with us. We're going to equip them. In our movement, most of us were young when we started. I know you might look around this today and be quite shocked by that thought. But actually, we were. Many of us were leaving churches in our 20s. Because it was a whole new move of God. Well, you understand we wanted to equip. So it doesn't mean that elders are the only people that do these things or that other leadership functions aren't required in healthy churches such as deacons, apostolic ministry coming in, prophets, evangelists, pastors, administrative leaders, all these you know, healthy churches need them. But we, we as elders provide direction, in broad terms, not every detail, we guard doctrine and we ensure discipline. I said ensure discipline, not doing all the discipline. So elders are primarily responsible for ensuring that these things happen in a healthy way rather than being the only people to do these things. The principle of delegating leadership responsibility is clear in the Old Testament. Exodus 18, you know, Moses nearly wore himself out because he didn't delegate responsibility. It was established very early in the New Testament, Acts 6, I've already, already referred to. We can't do all this, get some other people to do it. We've already seen that whilst in the New Testament church, the responsibility for the teaching of the word rested with the elders, 
others, both men and women, shared in this ministry. Teaching, instructing and exhorting the church. Similarly, the responsibility to direct the affairs of the church rested with the elders, the responsibility, but there's no suggestion that gifts of leadership and administration were only given to the elders. You understand the difference between being responsible for something and doing it all? Yeah. Yeah. One or two agree with me. Most look shocked. Okay. <laughs> Responsibility for the doctrinal safeguarding of the church resting with the elders, but others were involved in theological deliberation and instruction. And deacons were also charged to keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. And women could be deacons. And that's one of the, con the things that uh, they're, they're told to do. A responsibility to pray for the sick is given to the elders. I don't think any of us would think only elders can pray for the sick. Because yeah. gifts of healing are widely distributed in the body. But we're still responsible for it. For it. And there are times when it's right, call the elders in to anoint with oil. Yeah. So, how does that work? What I think, practically, what I think we're going to do, and each local church has to work this out for themselves how. There's no blueprint. We haven't got a blueprint for exactly how it all works in the New Testament. Therefore, we can't impose a blueprint today. Okay, so, how does it all work? Well, I would say there are different models that churches in our wider family on about <coughs> how you're doing it but that are working it out so there are different models as I say some of us have got around to appointing them properly as deacons some are still using other leadership terms because we've got to you know, explain it all that's a good place to time don't worry but uh some would have a, what we might call a senior leadership team of men and women where the elders who are responsible particularly within an eldership team for implementation work it out with them. So for example in our own church, I'll just say how we work it. Um, we have uh, elders who are on the staff of the church. We have things only. Only two of you now, isn't it, on the staff of the church? Yeah, you and Mark. Uh, all the rest of our staff are not elders. And we have four of us who are uh, bivocational, or in my case, retired, not doing anything much. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not true. So I am retired. But I, because my ministry is all outside the church, I'm like a elder with a full-time secular job. And that's how I've functioned for many years. And so the senior leadership team is you are two staff elders who've got because the, they're doing all the working out of all the detail how it runs the church. Otherwise they all get blocked bogged down in elder meeting and have to wait for people like me to be available. So they, most of the decisions are taken there for the running of the church. But the fatherly protection, guarding and direction is with the eldership team. But we will meet far less often than we used to. Because most of the day-to-day -day running is not done by us. We're just, they're protecting. Okay, that's one way of doing it. Uh, and with many of our elders meetings, we actually meet with a wider team of men and women, uh, simply because we want to make sure that we're not blinkered in the way we make decisions. 
we're still responsible. I mean, if you don't have women present when you're making important decisions, you can miss things. I know that's a total revelation to some of you elders, but you can. <laughs> and therefore, it's good to have that. It doesn't alter the fact that as elders we're still fathers and we're still accountable to God for the church. Yeah. You see what I mean? So that's how we do it at the moment. We haven't yet appointed some of those senior leadership team as deacons. We've got a bit slow on that. Uh, but, you know, and they get involved in other things. So Hudson was telling me on the way up, we've just started a new series in Ontario. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't there last Sunday. And uh, I didn't realise we were starting a new series. But one of our gifted women preachers initiated that series in that senior leadership team. I'm very, very happy with that. I have full confidence in her in terms of those sort of things. But I also know that's a delegated responsibility and I'm accountable for it. Do you understand? And if anything, and if I was there and uh, um, something was said was wrong, I would chat about it afterwards. If it was absolute heresy, you'd have to intervene, but that doesn't happen. Oh, I can think of it. Uh, because we're hopefully we're equipping the saints, so they're not heretics. The only time I've had to correct a heres heretical thing publicly, instantly, it was actually a prophecy and not a and not a teaching. And I actually have to get up and say that's unbiblical what was just said. But you uh, so it could work out like that. And I know on a, on a Sunday morning I rarely say anything. If I'm there <coughs> you, we do make sure that there's always a in our sights that there's an elder present in the Sunday meeting. If we possibly can wouldn't be legalistic. But we're not there. We're, we're, but when I'm there, as I'm there as an elder, I know people feel safe, but I, I normally do nothing unless God gives me a prophetic word or something. And even then, I hold back because I want to encourage the saints. So if other people are bringing things, oh, I don't need things. But I know my presence, and then people have said this to me, you make people, both, both the preacher and the worship leaders, and I always make sure I go up to them after yeah. and tell them they did a good job, yeah. when they did, and they usually do. <laughs> <laughs> and I try and get to people who've made a contribution if I can, you yeah. can't always because too many people, I'm just saying, well done. And that means a lot to them. Yeah. I mean, you know, I just think, well, why should what I say mean a lot? It does. Because okay? I'm a father in the midst. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Some of that would come from your own just that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. How does that work out? How do you feel that culture for someone of the Hudson's generation is not a person? But the same. He's not on the team. Hudson yeah. is an elder. Yeah, he's, a, he's an elder, but he's on the team, aren't he? Are there any elders that are not yeah, this... on the staff? Pardon? Have we got any elders that are not on the staff? Oh, yeah, we have four. I know you have two. Two uh, Younger. How old is Felix? Forces? Anyway. Can you talk a little bit how you feel? Yeah, okay. Well, really well I mean, elder. okay, with a younger elder. Yes, for them to be an elder, the church needs to have confidence in them. So if you're bringing someone for eldership, you give them a lot of visibility. They may not be a brilliant Bible teacher, or they may, but you make sure there are things where they are seen to be contributing so that the church gets confidence in them. 
Now, as the church grows, that's harder. As you have multi site, it's harder. Uh, you may have to just rely on the site. But um, the so, I mean, certainly when Hudson was not on staff when he became an elder, okay, he was in a secular job. Um, and we just made sure that he was visible to the church and you know when we announced we were thinking of bringing him into eldership it was an applause it wasn't, it wasn't you know do you understand so you um, so yes I admit I have a bit of an advantage because I'm grandpa as well okay but I'm just trying to use family language and some of those younger than me wouldn't be that but they still bring security yes yeah, so you do bring security to who you are every, time. Every, every year I say to Martin do you still want me around as elder and at the moment he said yes uh, but I would still be who I was <laughs> but but then that, that's all good isn't it so yes, you would make sure you don't bring anyone into eldership unless you know the church has confidence in And you work that through in the process of bringing someone into eldership. Okay? Would that be fair, Hudson? Another way of doing it is, I know one church who I work with quite a bit, they would be slightly more conservative than me on women preaching, but they get the general point. And so the, uh, they have a group of women who they see as gifted and senior in the church, who the elders meet with, say every third elders meeting or something like that. No, in order to get their input. Okay. Because actually who preaches in the end is an eldership decision, by the way. I'm not enforcing anything. Uh, it's a local eldership decision. I'm just trying to say some of the principles on which that should be made. I'm not going uh, to ride roughshod over every, everyone's content, anyone's conscience. So, uh, so they meet regularly with every other meeting or every one in three with a group of women who they respect say that we want your input on this okay. and that particular church which has a number of sites when I visited them we did a weekend together I also met with the site team of each church and that was men and women mm. if they wanted my advice on things do you see? Yes. And that's how we have site teams that are men and women as well, as well as the senior leadership team as men and women. We have site team for men and women. And uh, that's how that works out. <laughs> that's a question. Yeah? Um, there's nothing said that I don't understand I agree with. So I'm all the world saying to me. But what I think there is is the absence of language. So for example, if you've a child, it's like a mother and a father. Have a special word for father and not a special word for mother, distinguishing that role from all the other women, I think the child will be at a disadvantage. Sure. Now, from what you've said, the only word available is that we don't use, well, we don't use it in my So, I think that what the problem is, or what the content the is the absence of language. I, I think in the church, Speaking to a board of, like, to use the word pastor to mean full time Christian worker and like, a teacher or a prophet. You're absolutely so I right. Think the problem is language. I agree. Could you spare me a moment? Because I've got a whole thing on language at the end of this talk. Is that all right? Because <laughs> I agree with you. All right. You don't have to apologize. Okay. So it, so it often results in elders meeting less often on their own. Um, 
held us meeting regularly with a wider team. Another church I know, the Tech St. View elders are responsible, will call elders meetings when this one of the subjects that elders need to be at. And that would just be for elders, but on most of our meetings are leadership team meetings. There's different ways. You work it out. You know your church. Okay? But I think we've got to move away from all decisions, or most decisions coming from an elders meeting. And, you know, because sometimes we used to say, in the days when we were moving from one pastor to elders, we used to say there's a lot of teaching out. <coughs> Pastors are like the cork in the bottle. And I thought for a while, yeah. If you have elders, you've just got to think of cork. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> if you're not careful. If they do everything that the one pastor used to do. So we but we're here to equip the saints, that's pretty biblical. And yeah. So So language. Yeah, we get screwed up on language, I quite agree. Why are you apologising? That's just English culture apologising to those circumstances. Okay. So are Ukrainian refugees in the church? How are you getting on now in England? Oh we've learned to say sorry. <laughs> It's a again. So, language. Yes, I said biblically family language was the priority. Fathers, mothers. So even Paul, when writing in Romans 16, as I read, and greet Rufus and greet his mother, who's also been a mother to me. He's using family language, recognizing. People who are like mothers in the church is important. It doesn't mean they're a particular, they're not a particular group that you say, but you just refer to it. Oh, so, so, she's been like a mother in our context. Do you know what I mean? You just say in passing. You don't have to. So you're using appropriate language. Uh, Greek older women as mothers, it says. So they must have, that must have meant something to them in the way they spoke to them in a. Uh, a culture that would understand family. Okay, pastor. Ah, oh, that's a difficult one. And even within our wider network of churches, people use it very different ways. Okay, so some use it for the team leader of the elders. Well, that's not very, very biblical. That's how it's used. Or, um, or any one of the elders who's full time. Okay. Well, no, all the elders are pastors. But there'll be pastors that aren't elders because they've got a pastoral gift. So you're using it in the Ephesians 4 sense of people who can equip. You have no problem in saying if men or women can be an evangelist, they can equip the church. But then pastor we only use for, you know, if, if they're doing pastoral ministry and they're gifted for it, they're pastors. Whether they're elders or whether they're full-time or not. So, but, but we have lots of different places to communicate, that's the other problem. Because when you're, you can explain something in the church, but then when you're communicating to the out, world outside, you have to use words that they understand. Unfortunately, you do. You know? The only people that call me reverend are the HM Revenue and Customs. Yes. <laughs> them, I have to fit into a category, so I fit into the Reverend Devonish category. Because <laughs> it's the only thing the tax man understands. That's the what I do. 
So we have to, and, then, and also a lot of churches would use the word senior pastor for the team leader or lead elder simply because the world understands it. So we have to use language for them as well. Uh, and then that becomes those on the staff of the church, you know, the guy who heads up our social action. Yeah, he needs to be representing the church. And has to, I don't know what term he does use, but he has to be there as representing the church. So we have to, so the so language is difficult. Uh, I, mean, I took a guy with me to one of the bigger churches within the New Frontiers movement, and a uh, young, younger guy came with me on a trip overseas, and uh, they said to him, what's your, what's, what's your, oh, I'm a pastor in the church. Oh, so you're an elder there, are you? No. Because he was doing a pastor's work as a full-time member of staff, but he was under the authority of the eldership team. Yeah. So it's hard. Yeah. And yet, elders must all be pastors. I don't, I don't believe that, uh, and when I'm in, interviewing someone, well, when I've been asked to apostolically hang, lay hands on someone for eldership, I always meet them and their wife, Silla and I meet them and their wife first. Uh, I ask them what, because they may have a main other gift, but what past, what, who are you caring for? I always ask that question. Because the shepherd heart understands all, under, the shepherd heart underli underlies all Christian ministry. Okay? So language is a problem. I agree. I can't solve it for you. I'm just trying to explain how, in different contexts, you have to use appropriate language. Okay? And understand that. But there's other language we do need to abolish. Leaders and wives. Okay? <laughs> Let's drop that. Because... Because... What about leaders and husbands? Yeah. Because some of our senior leaders within the church, husbands are not leaders. And that's fine. Uh, and so, so we have to watch that sort of language. It also doesn't help Single people. <laughs> Men or women. Well, I haven't got a wife, can I come? Or I'm a single woman leader. So it's unhelpful language. Okay? Or the brothers. Let me tell the brothers. Now, that's okay if you're talking about, but you know, you'd say, in English, you'd say the brothers and sisters, wouldn't you? Unless you're talking about your natural family and the distinguish between your brothers and sisters. Or you might say, if you're going out on a men's retreat, a few of the brothers got together, that's all right. But be careful. With language that effectively puts people down. Elders and wives are just about permissible, except the only problem is, because I believe, the trouble is there may be single elders, and that's still unhelpful. Do you know what I mean? Just have to think. Yes. I may be misunderstanding you, but I thought you referenced earlier that one of the qualifications for an elder was to be a husband and wife. Yes. Do you then mean that if they have more than one wife, they would be unqualified? 
Yeah. If I have more than one wife, it's literally a one woman man. Okay? It's what he says. It's a good question, because I have actually had that question raised with me sometimes where he's single. Yeah, so is Paul, so is Jesus. Hardly a disqualification. Uh, so, so, yes, it's a one woman man, is the literal translation of that. In other words, they're not sexually immoral, basically. Okay. And you get other family type qualifications, actually. They're like, they can't take care of their family. How can they take care of the family of God? It's, the, it's, it, it's seeing that. Whereas they can be chief executive of a corporation quite well. So, also how we function in social gatherings, you know, you're not there as the elder then, you're just there <coughs> one of the good friends, you know, you're, and we don't put any, we don't have position, we don't think positionally. And it's probably not a problem in the UK, but in some countries I go to, the pastor's advice is asked for all sorts of things. Even things that he might be totally incompetent in. <laughs> <coughs> but because he's the pastor and he's seen as, you know, important person, they get his advice on things he knows nothing about. Well, I've seen some disaster for that. Some ministry in other cultures. <laughs> so, I'm just going to end with a quote from Steph Liston's book on 1 Corinthians. He was commenting on 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and headship. It is headship. He says this, there's more. While there's an inherited firstness that the father has, what does the father do with that? He exalts the son and wills that the son has preeminence in all things. He puts the son first. The son, in turn, is looking to take all that's been given to him by the father and, in a sense, bring it back to him. Says, when the end comes, he hands over the kingdom. If men, being created first, have a prominence through their headship, what are they to do with that? If they're looking to the father and the son as a model, they will lift up and promote gifted and godly women. How will the women respond? They will shine responsibly in a way that lifts up and promotes godly men. Both are in one sense doing the same thing. But there is a movement to it that matters because it reflects something of what we see between the Father and the Son. Just look at that. What do you reckon? It's so foreign from our hierarchical ideas so foreign from our culture, so foreign from the way expectations of our culture, even the debate of that, you know. The women have had to do a lot to get free on certain things, which I think is justice, you know, equal pay for equal jobs, of course. If they have the ability to lead a big corporation, they should lead a big corporation. You know? Even Prime Minister, the last example, didn't go too well. <laughs> but the... Uh, what, what, so what I'm saying is, we need to really uh, distinguish between, if you're in the home, you need fathers and mothers. Now we understand in some homes that's not possible and therefore we need to bring extra pastoral support and honouring into those circumstances. In the church we need to have family relationships fathering and mothering, brothering and sistering and really encourage that amongst us. I've finished. That's not a... I meant to just conclude with Steph's remarks but I just thought that's... 
a good way of expressing it. I hope that's been helpful. I've not I've been faithful to scripture. I've tried to be as much as I, I've tried to be. Even though those scriptures are difficult to understand, but I also, because of where I came from, understand the pain that arises from all three of those scriptures, whether it's head coverings, um, being silent in the church, or this one, how that has been unhelpful, because that was my upbringing. Um, and so I hope that we, we can look at all these scriptures in the light of what Stott said, the overall teaching of scripture and the historical context into which they're given, which we don't always fully know, but we need to try and work out. And we don't just work it out by secular history, we work it out as well by what the actual scriptures say. That's why I said it's quite obvious there were problems with some of the women in Ephesus in a way that wasn't the case in Corinth. So, there you are.